and bone flowers. <laughs> hey, everybody. You're listening to our podcast. I think we should do the whole episode like this. Sick. Okay. But should we be talking about something? Everything's fine. Everything is fine. We're doing good. Ron DeSantis is running for president. Be careful, Joe Biden. So the debt ceiling its really got me worried. It's got a leak. <laughs> I think they'll do a good job. What's up? It's Christian. Hello, I'm Justin. And it's time for Bonefish, the podcast about animal collective, psychedelic music, and other stuff. Hope you dug our ARC-inspired uh, intro. Justin, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing good. Um, can't complain. Remember when we uh, talked to Dave Portner? That was tight. Yeah, we really can't complain about anything. This week we're talking about Ark, formerly known as Here Comes the Indian. Yeah. And when we talked to Dave on the last pod, he uh, he said one of the things about this period that he was really after and also what he misses in today's music is... The faults and sort of like, yeah, the, the happy accidents mm-hmm. and when things just start to become too perfect, you know what I mean? It just starts to get boring to me and I, I, I feel like what I feel like we were trying to do with like stuff like Dance Manity or Arc was just sort of yeah, break things apart, you know what I mean? And the structures, I just, I value new structures and I feel like I get bored when I start to hear the same 4-4 tempos and guitar. I'm interested more in things getting broken apart and yeah, just becoming non-music almost. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> broken structures and borderline non-music. Pretty good primer for this record. Mm -hmm. Came out 20 years ago this June. Yeah, June 17th, 03 on Pawtrax. So in honor of the two-decade anniversary, we're going to go deep on ARC. The first quote-unquote Animal Collective album, by quote-unquote, of course, I mean the first album that at the time was called an Animal Collective album. Previous ones were retroactively added to the discography. Yeah. Yeah, they they figured it'd be way too many names to put on an album yeah. cover, so they they came up with a band name, which is cool. Although that's you know, talk about breaking structures. That's just another one to break. You know, how long can you make a band name? But yeah, I guess I guess once they got involved with Fat Cat, they were like, "All right, folks, what are you? Got to rein it in. Yeah, yeah. who are What's you? What are here? you?" <laughs> Fuck, who's the geologist? <laughs> yeah, so so for context for the band, a couple years on now from Spirit. And yeah, this this really was the time that stuff with The Collective was, was really popping off. You know, the, the previous release to this was Campfire Songs, which is sort of, yeah, a uh, pastoral, still experimental, but much more, I don't know, inviting. And then here we have... Before we go on to Song Tongs, which is maybe you could say a continuation from the Campfire Songs days, we have this exploration into uh, noise and deconstructing any sort of form of traditional song structure. Well, I was like listening back to this album, um, like, does it even matter if it's good or bad? (laughs) This music's so wild, like, can you even say whether it's good or bad? It's really wild, yeah. It's just like, yeah, there's (laughs) other words that serve that. I mean... Yeah, I think it's definitely an album that you sort of need to submit to, I think, to understand or to really, like, get out of it what it's asking for. Like, 
I mean, it's sort of, in my mind, it's like the Animal Collective, like, free jazz album. Like, it's just, it's sort of like, it resists structure. It doesn't resist, like, melody, but it definitely reframes it. And even just, like, time. Like, I think of, like, this album's use of time and space feels really bizarre and, and really resistant to, like, structure. I guess the word I keep coming back to. Yeah, I mean, I think... This album, Holundigain, Dance Manity, can be kind of grouped together as kind of their abrasive, noisy period, very NYC. Yeah, like bad vibes, New York City. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know part of the the background for the band is that, you know, they're coming off a tour, you know, one of their early tours that was, you know, marked by fan breakdowns and by all accounts, just a pretty rough time. And I think there's a quote from Dave somewhere that talks about how, like, partway through the tour, they knew they just needed to, like, get home, record the songs, and then, like, have some space from each other for a while. <laughs> I think some yeah. of that sort of, not negativity, but some of that, uh, I guess, abrasiveness definitely finds its way into the music. Yeah. I mean, Native Bell, sort of, like, ambient punk almost. It's like, it's, <laughs> like it's... Yeah, uh, like, I don't... And- Kind of gave me Fugazi vibes with the, like, extended silences and kind of, like... I love that. There's, like, the the pauses, I think, Mm -hmm. in that song, and then maybe the last song, but that I really like, where they kind of pause and go back into it. But, yeah, I don't want to say tribal, because I hate that word, but Hmm. it's definitely, like, primal, like, something very elemental about the the music. Why do you hate tribal? You just, it's, like, overused, you think, or, like... Yeah, I just think of like tribal tattoos and like uh, um, <laughs> yeah. like tool fans. That's true. T- Maybe not tool fans, is pretty, but yeah, <laughs> um, not definitely like a perfect circle or something. I think of <laughs> yeah. If you remember that band, um, anyway. no, I feel you on that. I mean, like there is definitely like a ritualistic. That's it. Yeah element like it seems like that's i think that's maybe what i mean when i say like you sort of have to submit to it like it's it feels like yeah like they're conjuring something yes definitely does this album sound like more organic to you or more electronic to you? That's a good question. Yeah. Because I've gone back and forth about this and I feel like recently I'm I'm hearing it differently. Yeah, it's sort of very all over the map. I mean, there's elements that are like so clearly acoustic, like I think of the drumming and like we said, the like sort of free time elements. Mm -hmm. Like it feels very off the quote unquote grid, you know, like there's... Like this band, you know, so many of their creations are organic and live. But yeah, at the same time, like the vocals are so... I mean, that's maybe one of the chief elements, the chief uh, distinguishable elements from this album is the sort of crazy mix of the vocals that sound like they're going through, guitar amps that are going through, you know, flangers that are like, you know... Panic. Yeah. Song where it's I just, mean, you know, that, 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 I mean, speaking yeah. of the ritual vibes, I think like... Hey Light, if that's like where I think if you're going into this album cold, you know, Native Bell into Hey Light is like by the time the like weak ceremonial chant comes in at the end of Hey Light, <laughs> it's like, like all, the off, clapping out of time, yeah, the out of time clapping. They just sound yeah. so cooked. I just feel like we're in like the basement of the uh, like Blair Witch Project like cabin at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's where I feel like it's like okay, like. What is what is this album doing? Where am I he- heading? And I think that that moment specifically, you know, especially before we get into infant dressing table, yeah, there's some kind of like summoning of of something. It, yeah, it feels like a weird trip. This album that's like yeah scary at times, maybe most of the time has like its moments of like euphoria and enlightenment, but is certainly like. It's pretty out there. I mean, it's it's definitely mostly working on a on like a darker palette. That's for sure. I mean, I feel like for a while the album to me just sounded more I don't know electronic for some reason. Definitely harsher, but 
listening to it recently, it sounds more kind of like organic or more like set in the natural world, maybe mm. like more like nighttime or something or like, yeah, I think of like, like the jungle in like predator. <laughs> like, I feel like this music would go like so good with that movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's even some like samples of what sounds like some kind of like weird creatures that are like kind of creeping up and sounds like they're about to like just bite you or something. <laughs> but yeah, I was, I mean, I feel like with their music, there's always that tension between kind of organic sounds and electronic sounds. Sometimes yeah. the organic, you know, sounds prevail more. Here, I think there's just a hint of that breaking through. Yeah, the album, I mean, it feels actually kind of claustrophobic and like feeling like maybe feelings of being trapped or smothered. And I don't know if that's because they're kind of like these rural kids, these hippies at heart who are kind of like stuck in this concrete jungle, like New York. And yeah, this is them kind of like breaking through that or working against it or purging something. Yeah. I Just mean, like why, definitely, yeah. Like why did they, why did they make this music, man? Why are they all screaming in, <laughs> in 360 panorama around me? And why is panic like a slow mo? horror movie (laughs) so re-listening to to panic um i mean which i've always liked but what came to mind was the scene in nope where that flying creature sucks everybody up i still haven't seen it oh damn (laughs) well i'm gonna sorry it's all good spoiler alert but i'm gonna say it because there's a scene where people are getting sucked up by this ufo thing and they're just screaming and it's terrifying and it sounds like panic the song on this album it's so good i love i I love how that song sounds i mean i feel like yeah, it's like a vacuum and like yeah. just delay upon delay upon delay and like the pitch vocals all like looping and it does feel cool too how the album is sort of feels like structured like one of their live shows like the first two songs i feel like are sort of two of a pair you know and then infant dressing table and uh panic also go exactly into each other it's like hard mm-hmm. to tell where one start starts one, yeah one ends yeah it's cool how it does sound live yeah I and mean, they probably record it live right I mean, yeah i mean they were playing these songs for like all of o2 yeah <laughs> I think Infant Dressing Table is really the the song where, especially coming off of Haylight, where we're like conjuring some sort of seance, you know, it sort of feels like the onset. And then by Infant Dressing Table, you know, we're like fully under the, under the spell, like in the trance, we're on the journey. Yeah. Like just the length of it and the, the way it like resists any sort of central motif, I think that's what makes me call this like the Anko Free Jazz album just because it's like when you're listening to that song you're like waiting for something maybe the first time you hear it and you know maybe that arrives or maybe it doesn't for you but but yeah like for me I think like one of the things one of my ways into this track was that like sort of repeated low pulse that's like boom 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 that's you know joined by like those vocals that are I'm really curious how they did that. Like, I know it, when we talked to Dave, he talked about how they would, like, use the filters on the synths they had and, like, sing through those and stuff because they had the audio in. So I wonder if there was some way that those, like, pulses were on the same, you know, like, envelope as those vocals. But, uh-huh. like, that for me was my way in and, like, a, yeah. a way to, like, sort of realize, okay, I, I need to stop, like, looking for something. Like, I need to just arrive in this yeah. song, like... Yeah, amazing, amazing ending with those vocals. Well, they, they really becoming more and more isolated, and like, yeah. I mean, they slowly just keep building tension, and it releases like at the very end, but kind of just dissolves instead yeah. of like going into something else. And like, yeah, I mean, it literally sounds like pigs are being slaughtered or something <laughs> during the track. Like, <laughs> like literally caged animals like dying. I wonder what infant dressing table means. 
Like, what is that a thing? Infants can't dress themselves. Maybe just like <laughs> changing a diaper to dress or them on a table would be dangerous. I guess like yeah, yeah if you're like like laying them down on yeah. the table. I don't think anyone was a parent yet <laughs> uh, in the band. Um, but I've always liked always liked that song. Infant dressing table. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I like like every song on the totally. Album. <laughs> I mean, infant might be my favorite. Might be up there for maybe a top two songs on the album. Two sales. I'd say. I mean, you know, that and infant are definitely like the two sort of tent pole, ambient pillars of the album. Yeah, you have the kind of you know dial up frequency or like high frequency Morse code type pedal tone through going through the whole song. The vocals really like made me think of Odd Sack, sort of the weird pitch down monster AV vocals, which I know is like several years off at this point, but on two sales. Yeah. Yeah. Like I feel like you can start to see some of the some of the seeds there being planted that way. Yeah. Would... That one sounds like the most kind of maybe organic or like and it sounds like like yeah, a monster's like coming up and about to just yeah destroy everything. Yeah. Just sustained tones, sustained chords. Very Lamont Young in that way. And yeah, and then into Slippy, the jubilant explosion. It's a, that's, I feel like this track also, it's, I think it's a good yeah. sort of example too of like why maybe this album is more successfully engaged with if you listen to it all the way through. Because like, I don't know, you could play someone like Slippy and they might be like, okay, that was sort of crazy and odd. But th but if you play them Slippy after having them hear two sales on a sound, you know, for that, like if they, yeah. if they get through that whole excursion wow, and then pop song. right the slippy, right? Exactly. It's totally, you know, it's this, it's like you've wandered kind of through the quote unquote desert and like found the, you know, you you rewarded with this insane, yeah, manic track. I love the like, yeah, the crazy rhythm of slippy is like, I don't know, it, it like tickles that part of my like rhythmic brain that I'm, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's great. Um, yeah. The uh, have you ever heard the live version of Slippy like done during Meriwether? Yeah, definitely. But I, I I probably heard that. It's probably like the version of Slippy I was first familiar with. You I know, think. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same. I yeah, actual... I think it's so good. Yeah. And they did also, they did Haylight on that tour too. Or, yeah. Or, or around that era. It's really good too. It's cool. I wonder or what about the Meriwether tunes, like put those songs kind of back in the t into their minds. I feel like it's funny, like, I don't know, we were talking about how maybe Campfire songs, you can sort of see the seeds of song tongues there. But when Slippy comes on, I can sort of start to hear some kind of pre sung song tongues vibes, like the way the rhythm goes into like, from that sort of off kilter beat into just like the four on the floor, like. Yeah. As we like, we tigers or like, yeah, sort of that like some actual singing melodies. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. You can kind of hear like who can win a rabbit predecessor yeah but it's also still crazy that um literally when this album dropped they were already playing sung tongs which were just totally different yeah um, just a totally different palette you know just a totally different vibe which is cool yeah And yeah, the last track, Too Soon, again, we have this like unique use of space, sort of 
climactic ending vibes, which is, you know, classic Animal Collective for the last track on the album. You know, it feels like this sort of resolution of tension. Mm -hmm. And then with this, like, ambiguous coda. I haven't seen a lot of, like, live videos from this era, but listening to this album a bunch this last week has made me want to look into some stuff. And I feel like this song, especially too soon, and just, like, how they translated these weird uses of, like, time and silence into live setting, I feel like is, yeah. I would, I would, yeah, that must have, like, took some practicing because they're, like, uh -huh. they're so in sync with, with the pauses, the starts and stops. I know there's, like, a good show that's been floating around at the Tonic. I think it was, like, 2002. But it's these songs hmm. done in different order. Yeah. It's really cool. Nice. Yeah, I wonder, like, I mean, we know Noah's on drums, Dave's probably doing Dave stuff, Juno <laughs> 6, Geologist is doing his mini disc thing. I wonder, like, what was Deacon doing? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's definitely, like, guitar there's, like, guitar stuff. on this album, I think. I mean, as you know, it's hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'd be curious what sort of, what the breakdown is instrumentally. I'm also like I'm I'm sort of fascinated by like the critical response to this album. Okay, like, can you can you guess what Pitchfork gave this? Well, I, I know because oh, I saw it earlier know. today. Well, they gave it an eight point six. Eight point six, which in twenty twenty three numbers would be a seven point six. I think. Okay. Right. Still, I mean, but that's the. I mean, I'm saying like today, <laughs> it, this album would probably get a seven point six, right? Which is good. Yeah. But an eight point six is like pretty freaking good especially for this bizarre of an album like i feel like i feel like i wonder if it's a case of just like the critics being like primed to just love whatever these guys were like doing at the time or i mean i, I you know, i'm not saying you know i uh, yeah i mean this is a great album but I, it's just it's, it's sort of crazy looking back like i mean i think for like people at pitchfork around this time which okay which was like a wild wild west yeah you know, it's just like dudes being like oh dude like like, like listen to this band you know but I think part of the reason was that they, you know, got the coverage they did or the props they did was obviously they're they're really good and exciting, but mm -hmm. like these writers were like, oh, this is ours. This is something new that that we discovered. Like, yeah, and and I yeah, think yeah. I just want to champion. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense a lot. Yeah, and and also it's yeah, it's and they were probably you know you know. Everyone was listening to the fucking Strokes and the Rapture during right. this time. This is pre Condé Nast. Pitchfork, so right, <laughs> yeah, is, yeah. This is pre-imperial phase Pitchfork, um, so I'm sure there was a, a huge hunger for just really alternative music, and yeah, and they're different. I mean, that's it's long been a priority of, or you know, maybe not long been, but definitely, certainly at one point, it was a big priority for that outlet was like just originality. Well, uniqueness. yeah, I mean, you look at all the other albums that came out in '03, and it's like you got uh, Elephant, White Stripes, yeah came out in 03 Hail to the Thief mm -hmm. great album phenomenal um, Jay-Z Black Album Outcast Speaker Box Love Below wow Give Up Postal Service how about The Laos in the Comatorium by the Mars Volta <laughs> were you ever into the Mars Volta <laughs> no Dude. not really I was super into them in high school yeah is it, is it a good album it's uh yeah it's pretty awesome I mean it's like crazy prog you know rock like cool. super high pitched vocals but I don't know. Definitely some parallels with Animal Collective in terms of like resisting structure and yeah, yeah it's like the Laos and the Comatorium is their first and I think my favorite album of theirs. It's definitely like a yeah, sort of epic like concept album uh, about a dude that goes into a coma and then like has a crazy like internal hallucination, which is like wow. the album. But but yeah, that came out in two thousand three. Uh, also, Lightning Bolt. Did you ever listen to Lightning Bolt? Wonderful Rainbow. No, they're like a Providence band? Yeah, yeah. Didn't Island. they come up with like Black Dice or something? 
too? Probably. I mean, they're super, they're definitely in the like freak art rock zone. Yeah. A lot of the vocals actually on okay. Ark remind me of Lightning Bolt. Um, it's like, it's, it's like just they're... a two piece. It's like a bass player who's like, you know, playing bass too crazy, like distortion pedals, and then a drummer. Brian Chippendale, who like goes uh -huh. absolutely berserk and has like a mask with a microphone attached to it, and it's all sort of, yeah, like uh, scattered, kind of indecipherable vocals. Nice. But that album that came out that year, Wonderful Rainbow, is is really sick. Have you seen the Pitchfork review for this album? It's uh, interesting. I didn't. I didn't um, reread it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna read it, but check it out if you're interested. It's sort of like, yeah, an example of kind of music journalism that they don't really do anymore. It's like clearly like a fan of the band who he sort of tells like a first person story that involves his hands like morphing into thumbs <laughs> and then like jamming with. Animal Collective and like the woods and it's like written like like a like a fable. Yeah, I don't know. It's I found it gave gave me a little chuckle. Yeah, I mean the goofy. Like I wonder if you're at Animal Collective, which, which I kind of miss. Like you know, it's it's gotten so like academic and yeah, I mean, just so like it's so copy paste these poli days and political yeah. and like right, yeah. It's not really about the music. It's kind of just about backstories and whether like this is like tasteful or not so i mean i appreciate this review trying to go for it but yeah it's like this would never run in in 2023 pitchfork speaking of pitchfork i uh came across this feature on the band which was published february 8th 2016 uh so kind of in like the painting with era but uh the interviewer asked a question sort of apropos of nothing he says would you mind listening back to an old song, 2003's Infant Dressing Table? Brian says, that's a long one, right? Pitchfork goes, we don't have to listen to the whole thing. And then Noah goes, I always thought it was Infinite Dressing Table. <laughs> to which Brian says, it was, but then we changed it. I'm not sure why. Sometimes I wonder what the title really is. Then he goes on to say, me and Dave had to reapprove a new test pressing for this record in 2010, so we had to listen to the whole thing from beginning to end on vinyl. It had been years since I'd heard it, and we both almost just couldn't. We were like, who is this? There were all these layers that I'd forgotten about. It was really just a crazy experience. And then Pitchfork says, uh, do you feel a through line from this to Animal Collective now? Dave responds, that record is a lot more improv based than our last couple. It feels less grounded, more chaotic, very much New York. So good call, Justin, nice. on calling it a New York record. Brian goes on, more druggy. I mean, I haven't gotten high in the studio for a long time, but I was high during that whole recording. We did that album right after we came back from a really stressful tour, and I remember a friend who was working at the studio where we were recording saying, I thought you guys were lunatics. You didn't speak. You were just such weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Josh Dibb says, I don't really remember it being like that. I generally think of it as a positive experience. I wanted to be there. And then Brian says, it just felt like life. We were used to always being exhausted and stoned, but apparently it looked weird to other people. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, that was interesting. It sounds like they were, you know, they were living that life, which... Uh... You can tell through the music. Yeah, um, that knife hits life. I don't know, I guess you can debate the merits of like talking about their like the Pitchfork score or whatever for this album, but it is interesting that it's like their third or fourth highest rated record, but, you know, something that you really don't hear mentioned a ton, like in yeah, terms that, of influence. It's really not as like, and especially hearing them say like, oh yeah, we're, well, what were we doing? <laughs> I don't know, it's interesting. Like it could be both things, right? It can be like a groundbreaking piece of art at the time and it could be something that 
Yeah, I think like at this period, like no one knew what the ceiling for them was, so it was kind of like, this is a good album. Like, oh, this album's pretty good, and like it just kind of kept going up and up and up, you know. So like yeah. at the time, you know, this was like a legit great album, but it just like kept going, you know. Yeah. But uh, no, yeah, that that is interesting. I mean, I, I yeah, I agree. Like. It's definitely one of their more freeform ones. I mean, the the music just kind of like feels like like very ancient and definitely free, but it also feels like they're like pushing against something, like you know, like um, just kind of structures modern society. Like, yeah, they literally sound like caged animals. Like they're trying to break free. Yeah, you know, like I I hear that. Yeah, and it's not even their weirdest album. Like, um, what do you think's weirder? I mean, Dance Manity, yeah. Helinda Gain, probably, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's up there as one of the weirdest yeah. for a band that's already fucking weird. But I think they were definitely, like, a little frustrated. So that that's kind of what I hear. Like, yeah, like... Inner city angst. Yeah, like There's... young guys, inner city angst, kind of uncertainty. This yeah. darkness pervading. It does also feel kind of claustrophobic, like being in like a fucking shitty New York City apartment, you know, yeah. making this music. And almost like nothing repeats. Mm. It does feel like sort of through composed, like there's just mm-hmm. the complete absence of like repetition, which, you know, might have reflected their lives at the time, you know, dropping out of school and going from heavily structured place to like the open endedness of being on your own in a huge city. You know, I mean, I mean, Slippy is probably the exception. Yeah. With like, in terms of like, it has a chorus, has a verse chorus structure as close as you could get. I was looking back on like some old, you know, like Reddit posts and stuff to see what people had to say about this album. And I remember some people saying it's like, this album doesn't feel like recorded music. It feels like something that sort of just happened and like, Totally. Happened to be recorded and like like somebody was just listening into like a fucking seance yeah. somewhere in <laughs> you know in the middle of nowhere in in a forest or something something 100%. that like shouldn't be recorded or something like that like defies recording almost but like yeah it's yeah it's it's also crazy to think about that this is the same group of people the same four guys that made time skiffs that made Centipede Hurts, Strawberry Jam, and Feels, right? Yeah. Yeah. All very different albums. Super different. And I think, too, it's worth noting that even the fact that it came up in our interview with Dave, that he was like, when you asked him, what are you looking for in music now? Like, what still excites you? The fact that he, like, brought up this bizarre record. It's like, well, at least for Dave himself, it's still, like, something he traces back as, like, a foundational sort of artistic yeah you know uh motivation and i think it's notable that you know this was the record where they decided to crystallize around this central name of like animal collective and sort of like embracing you know animalistic instincts and like i think i feel like it's fitting and it is kind of the first record where yeah like the kind of primal elemental kind of chanting part of the band becomes a thing really because like before before this one there wasn't really like any chanting really or anything you know there's like hints of it here and it, and it comes more to the center with like sung tongs the next one yeah and and so forth but so kind of a lot of firsts in that regard for this record i mean i mean listening back i i like it like more like i it, it like it finally like kind of like clicked for me actually like yeah and before where I saw it more as kind of like this maybe like synthetic thing or electronic thing, it sounds actually more like organic and like feral, which is cool. So it just sounds different now to me. Yeah, definitely feral. I feel like in terms of like revisiting, I feel like I sort of gravitate more towards the, you know, quote unquote, more ambient soundscape tracks than the like. Same here.
you know, we haven't really talked a lot about like the lyrics of this album, which I feel like the reason for that is like somewhat obvious. But I don't know. Do you have any? I mean, it seems like it's pretty deliberately like not asking for really close. There's some memorable ones. Lyrical scrutiny. Oh yeah, what for, are, what are they for you? I did a lot of daydreaming in day school. Yeah, which I only understood once I heard the Meriwether version of Slippy, because otherwise you can't really understand the lyrics. But yeah, right. Yeah. Or I did a lot of day, I did a lot of dreaming in day school. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I always like the line also in Slippy. It's something. It's like at the end of the chorus, it's something like we want music with our eyes closed. Yeah. Um, and then of course. And I'm shouting because you're naked. Ah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I dug what you said about these sort of Maryland hippies at heart kind of reacting to life in the inner city. Yeah. Also, like, immediately post-9-11 New York, you know, I mean, that's not... Exactly. That can't be... Like, if they were... Can't be ignored. If they were in... It's an insane time to be in that area of the country. Yeah, and if they were making music, say, in Maryland, it would not sound like this. We know it, what it would sound like, and it would sound like campfire songs. Exactly, yeah. Which is an acoustic, ambient record. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I love the, like, almost parabolic pattern this band sort of goes on between paranoiac claustrophobia and sort yeah. of more warm and inviting folk stuff yeah that's a great point contrasting it to campfire songs in that way but I mean they're definitely a band I mean they've said it like the environment impacts their creativity so much you know yeah which I totally get that like I feel like they air on the the nature instead of nurture side <laughs> Your average Animal Collective fan probably doesn't like regularly listen to this album, right? Yeah. Or should we be careful about saying that? Because I'm sure there are some heads out there that are like, yeah. "Here comes the Indian," is my shit. Fuck Meriwether Post Pavilion. <laughs> this is like the peak. And if you're that listener, we want to hear from you. Yes. Hit Can us we- up Instagram Bonefish Pod. <laughs> Bonefishpod at gmail.com. The real archeads. Let your voice be heard. You made a you made a cool little panda bear playlist on Spotify. Panda Bear Collabs. Oh yeah. Check, Check that, that out. out. Jinx. And then yeah, I had that cool little interview on that uh Animal Collective fan site, Merryweather Post, with Noah about uh some upcoming music. Yeah, sounds like his next solo album is called Sinister Grift, which is yeah. a sick name. Yeah, I think it's been floating around for a while, but there is a set of those songs on online on YouTube of him playing. Looks like he's going back to like guitar and some rhythmic stuff. Oh, interesting. Some like four on the floor stuff. It's Tomboy cool. vibes, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Cool. Well, sick. Super fun. Spending time with this album. And super fun talking to you, Justin. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sweet. Till next time. Bye. Peace, owners. Fera Jaca, Fera Jaca, Fera